Nowhere in the gospel we call Luke does the author identify himself. Tradition claims that Luke wrote it, perhaps the one mentioned in Philemon. But it is still an anonymous work, and the speculations about authorship are just that. No one knows for sure who wrote it. An X, please, and let's move on. What about the competency of this witness? It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee. Perfect understanding of all things? Well, we'll see about that. Luke may not be humble, but he is competent to stand trial. No eggs here. Luke, if I may use the name out of convenience, tells us in no uncertain terms that he was not an eyewitness to the events, for he admits that many Gospels had been compiled before he decided to write his. This is not something an eyewitness would do, that is, reference all the other anonymous Gospels in order to create your own, supposedly, accurate version. We also have no original or anything close to it. An X in the hearsay box, and let's continue. Like Matthew and Mark, Luke is obviously a Christian with his own theological agenda. For if Mark or Matthew or any of the other Gospels floating around had actually gotten the story right, Luke would not have felt compelled to create his own accurate version. So since Luke, like the other two, was a Christian who would gain from the spread of his particular brand of religion, we can put an X in the bias box and move on. Does Luke make any inconsistent statements? It is almost universally believed that the author of the Gospel of Luke was the same person as the author of Acts of the Apostles. If that's true, we can find some inconsistencies between Luke and Acts and within each writing as well. But we only need to show that the witness is inconsistent, not that one or the other work is inconsistent with itself. But in his subsequent work, Luke claims that Jesus hung around for over a month before ascending back into heaven, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. If Luke wrote Acts, then we must conclude that he has given us inconsistent information regarding how long Jesus was on earth after his resurrection. Another example from Acts shows inconsistencies regarding Paul's conversion experience. Acts recounts three different and irreconcilable versions of the conversion of Paul. This image shows the problems with each. Did the companions of Paul hear the voice? Did they see the light? Did they fall to the ground or remain standing? Did Jesus inform Paul about his Christian purposes, or did Ananias? It depends on which account you want to believe. Our witness also makes historical errors, such as the laughable requirement that every family return to where they were born in order to take a census. And like Matthew, he freely edits his sources while copying the parts he likes, often verbatim. And for those of you who aren't sure if Luke copied from Mark's written text, take a moment and compare these two passages. This is where Jesus heals a demon-possessed man while in the city of Capernaum. Luke's verbatim copying of Mark stretches on for a total of 26 words. And we know Luke is copying Mark and not Matthew because this miracle does not appear in Matthew at all. But Matthew does take the words of the demon and sticks them in the mouth of the two demon-possessed men living in a cave by the sea. We've seen enough to place an X in the box and move on. Can we consider this witness to be a truthful witness? Luke is the latest of the four canonical gospels, and as we might expect, contains a more evolved theology 
that improves the image of Jesus even over Matthew's improved versions of Mark. Here's one example where Luke removes completely the anguished cry of the forsaken Jesus found in both Mark and Matthew. After removing the content of Jesus' loud cry, Luke then informs us that Jesus uttered another phrase, a detail not to be found in any other gospel we know of. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Why would Luke completely remove the part where Jesus asks his heavenly Father why he had forsaken him? Especially when it is found in the earlier Gospels, Mark and Matthew, upon which Luke relies almost exclusively. Not to mention that Luke is copying parts of his sources verbatim and not paraphrasing as an eyewitness would. Since most of our first two witnesses' testimony is found in Luke, where did he get this into thy hands saying from? Some might say he got it from the hypothetical Q document, but Q never contained anything from the passion narratives, so we might wonder if Luke has deliberately deleted the anguished cry of Jesus found in Mark and Matthew because Luke's Jesus cannot be seen as fearful and instead inserted fiction here to further embellish the story and pull at our heartstrings. One has to wonder how Mark, Matthew, John, and all the apocryphal gospels didn't quite catch Jesus uttering this just before he died while John apparently caught something none of the others did when he recorded Jesus as saying, It is finished. Ah, but we do know where Luke got this phrase. The same garage sale where Matthew and Mark got most of their passion sayings from. The good old Hebrew Scriptures. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Erasing Jesus' cry of desperation attested to by both Mark and Matthew, and then jerking an Old Testament verse completely out of context and installing it into the mouth of Jesus doesn't sound very truthful to me. Could we have an X in the box, please? Thanks. As for contradiction, we've already seen our witness provide a contradictory statement regarding whether Paul's companions heard the voice of Jesus or not. One account he gave said explicitly that they did hear the voice, and another account says explicitly that they did not hear the voice. We'll put an X in the contradiction box and move on to our final witness. As with the other three, we don't even know who our witness is. The gospel is attributed to a John, but was written anonymously. Church tradition claims that it is the disciple mentioned in the gospel whom Jesus loved, and this phrase is claimed to be a euphemism for the author himself. Some claim the author was John, the son of Zebedee, Two verses are sometimes cited as proof that the author was an eyewitness to the events recorded, John 19.35 and 21.34. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. This is unpersuasive at best. Who is the he in this case? There is no one named here. So even if we grant that this he is in fact the author referring to himself in the third person, he does not seem very willing to tell us just who he is, so we still cannot leave the anonymous box empty. But what about John 21, 34? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. This seems to corroborate the idea that the beloved disciple is the author of the gospel. Unfortunately, as we learned earlier in this series, the entire 21st chapter of John 
was a later addition, not written by the original author. Perhaps the line, we know that his testimony is true, is a little bit of a clue. An X in the anonymous box, and let's continue. I don't think the author is incompetent in any way, so we'll leave that box empty. Now, if we grant that the author of the gospel wrote chapter 19, verse 35, and that he meant the he to be a roundabout way of referring to himself, then what we have is the witness himself claiming to be an eyewitness of the events, first-hand knowledge of what went down. But I intend to show that this is not the case. But doing so is not going to be so easy this time. I have a hunch we're dealing with a very clever witness. Let's see what we can dig up. 